4.2 is graphing polynomial functions by hand. So what we're going to be doing is, even though we might use our calculator to find a max or min, or maybe do the actual computing, we're not going to use the graphing part of the graphing calculator, which is kind of cool that we're, we're able to do this. So before we do it, let's look at some things that we know. It says if p of x is a polynomial, so they'll call it p of x, f of x, h of x, they'll call it anything. Um, if n is the degree, then the graph of the function has at most n real zeros and n x-intercepts, meaning if it's a third degree polynomial, at most it crosses three times and at most it has three zeros. Does it have to have three? No, it can have three, two, or one, or none, all right? But if it's a third degree polynomial and it has five, that's something's wrong, okay? So you're not going to go about that. And then at most n minus one turning points, think of a parabola, it's a second degree and it turns once, right? So you only have as many turns um, as one less than your degree. Nothing that you have to like die hard, memorize, but just something to keep in mind while you're graphing, okay? So let's look at how we're going to do this. And um, these steps, I call it kind of the skeleton. And what you'll see here in the next couple examples is exactly what you'll see on the test, where I kind of leave, um, guide you with the skeleton, but I leave space for you to actually do it. So you don't have to memorize the steps. You just have to understand the steps and know what to do at that particular step. So step number one says using the leading term test, determine the end behavior. So that's what we did last week with 4.1. If it was an even degree polynomial, both of your ends were either going up or down depending on whether A was positive or A was negative. If it was an odd degree polynomial, it was um, one's going up and one's going down. Again, which one, it depend on if A was positive or A was negative. So that's gonna be number one, is you kind of drawing it and maybe state even and up or down and odd or whatever it may be. Number two is find the zeros of the function, and it's kind of nice that I even tell you what to do. So in order to find the zeros, we just set the function equal to zero and solve. So you're going to either solve um, using algebra and factoring or using your quadratic formula. In some cases, we might have to use the calculator, but most of the time I'm going to give you stuff that you can do by hand, so that way on the test we'll have a by hand portion where you don't even have to use a calculator. All right, three, use the x-intercepts that you just found. Okay, so zeros are x-intercepts. To divide the axes into intervals, so it's like baby domains, right? So say we're crossing at two, then we're gonna go from negative infinity to two, and then two to infinity, okay? And that way we're gonna just get these test points, okay? So once we drive, dive it into intervals, we're gonna choose a test point that's in the interval. And what we're going to do is we're going to plug it into the function. We don't necessarily care what the y value is. We just care whether it's positive or negative because we'll know the graph is going to go above the x-axis at that interval or below. Um, if you do actually write the y value, it's good because it's just an extra point that you can plot on the graph. Number four, find f of zero. That's the y-intercept, guys. So just plug zero in for x, see what you get, and that will be a point we can graph on the, the um, graphing calculator. Five, it says, if necessary, find any additional values to determine the general shape of the graph and then draw the graph. So if you, we start to graph all this stuff, like the zeros, the y-intercepts, our test points, and there still seems to be kind of gaps and we're not too sure, just pick random x values that are maybe between your x-intercept and that test point, and we'll put them in the function and see what it is. Is that the same thing as, like, when you put it into the calculator and it has you, like, on one side, yep. like another, mm -hmm. and it yep. And so that's how you find the zeros by calculator. Yep. So six, as a partial check, use the fact that the graph has at most n x-intercepts and at most n minus one turns. Um, remember, the multiplicity of zeros can be considered. So if your your multiplicity was odd, you're crossing through. If your multiplicity was even, you were just touching and going back. All right. Um, and at the end, we can check it with our graphing calculator. So how these notes are typed up is what you'll see on a test. So example one says graph by hand the polynomial function f of x equals 2x cubed plus x squared minus 8x minus 4. And what you'll see is I have steps one through six listed in little i, little double i, and so forth, all right? So the first thing that says what is going to be the end behavior? And it's the leading term. So this is the leading term. And looking at that leading term, notice that it's an odd degree, right? It's a third degree. So that means we're going to have the arrows where they look like they're dancing, one's going up and one's going down. And then our A is positive, which means technically it's the up position. The up position just means your typical cubic. So if you remember, so I'm going to write odd degree, and I'm going to write up kind of in quotes. 
is this guy. Right? Your typical cubic starts low, comes up, crosses through the x-axis, and then continues to go higher. All right. Step number two. Find the zeros of the function which produce the x-intercepts. The zeros of the function mean set your function equal to zero and solve. So we have zero equals 2x cubed plus x squared minus 8x minus 4. If you don't like that, if you like the zero being on the other side, then you can do that. All right, so you will always be given one that's either already factored or is factorable so that you don't have to use your calculator to find the zeros. So remember, four terms was the very first thing we learned how to factor. It was just that factor by grouping. So leave zero over here and look at these two terms. What can you pull out of 2x cubed plus x squared? X cubed. X, oh, not x cubed, x squared, perfect. When you do that, you haven't touched the two, so he's still there. You had three x's, you took one away, so you have an x. And then don't put zero there, it's one. You have to say what I took out is exactly what I, 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 um, I wanted, okay? Then here, what can we pull out of these two terms that, so that 2x plus 1 is 2x negative 2. Nope. Negative 4. Negative 4, right? Oh. 8 and 4 have 4 in common. How I do it is I just think, okay, what do I want to divide 8 by that, so that a 2 is left, a 4? And th then think about your signs. Both of these signs are positive. Eight both of those are negative. Eight to four. Yep. That, yeah, that's where we want it to go, right? So we have negative 4. So negative 8 divided by negative 4 is a positive 2. We didn't touch the x. Negative 4 divided by negative 4 is a positive 1. And that's what we want to happen because our final factored form is 2x plus 1 times x squared minus 4. Okay? What you'll notice is one term's linear. What do I mean? The degree is 1. So that 2x plus 1 is going to be really easy to set equal to 0 and solve. That second term is um, of the second degree, or quadratic, it's actually factorable. That's a difference of two squares, so you can go one more step. I tend to go the square root method. That way you always know how to solve. So even if that was a 5, x squared minus 5 is still solvable using the square root method. Okay. So once we have our factors, we just set each of our factors equal to 0. Right? So on this side, you're going to subtract the 1 over and divide by 2. So what do you'll get? You'll get x equals negative 1 half. Over here, you're going to add the 4 over, but then you want to get x by itself. So what do you have to do to both sides? Take the square root. But remember, when you put the square root there, what do you have to put in front of that square root? Plus, Plus or minus. This is a perfect square, so when we take the square root, the square root disappears, right? x equals plus or minus the square root of 4, which is just plus or minus 2. Is that okay? So what I'm going to do, you don't have to do this because this is all just steps to helping us solve. Over here in this free space, I'm just going to list my zeros from lowest to highest, okay? So we have negative 2, negative 1 half, positive 2. Do you guys agree with that? So again, you could have factored x squared minus 4 to x plus 2, x minus 2, solved each of those and gotten 2 and negative 2. But the reason why I'm not going that direction is because I don't want you to stop if it's not a perfect square. Like if that's 13, then x equals plus or minus the square root of 13. All right, so the reason why I listed them this way is when we go to flip the page, you're going to notice this chart. And this chart is going to be given to you on the exam. And it's what the directions were telling us in step number Three, use your zeros to split your whole domain into these little intervals, okay? So we're going to start at negative infinity, but we're going to stop at our first zero, negative two. And then we're going to start where we left off, negative two to our next zero, negative one half. Then we're going to start where we left off, negative one half to two, and then from two to infinity. So we're just going to expand, we're going to travel the whole domain, but we're going to do it in little chunks, okay? So on the test, it'll be on one page, so you don't have to like flip back and forth and remember what exactly we had. So just for our reference, I'm going to write our zeros up here. Remember, they were negative 2, negative 1 half, 2. Just so you can kind of see where we're coming up with our intervals. Okay, so start from the furthest left, so negative infinity, and stop at your first zero of negative 2. And then start where you left off, negative 2, and go to your next zero. Start where you left off, negative one half, and go to your next zero. 
go all the way to the house and Yes. Okay. And then we're going to start at two and go to infinity. So the whole idea of it, guys, is that we know what's happening at negative two, negative one, half, and two. The function is zero. We're crossing the x-axis. The question is, before we get to negative two, are we below or above it? Okay, so we're gonna take a test point that's in that interval, plug it in and get a y value. If it's a negative y value, you, we know we're coming up from the negative infinities. And then in this interval, if it's a positive y value, we know that we've crossed over and we're in the positive y values and so forth. The more values you have, the more it's easy to graph and so forth. So what I typically hint at is pick a value that's not too large. So like, could you pick negative 1,000? You sure could. Negative 1,000 is between negative infinity and negative two, but how annoying is that to plug into our function and find the value? So I say stay small, use ones and zeros if you can, that kind of idea. So what I'm gonna write on here again, guys, just so we don't have to flip flop, is our actual function. So our actual function was f of x equals 2x cubed plus x squared minus 8x minus 4. Okay, and I'm just getting that from the front page. So what would be a convenient point to pick in the first interval? What's the smallest we can go? Not 1, 1's not in that first two. interval. Not negative 2 because we already know what's happening at negative 2. If I wanted negative 2, I'd have a bracket there. Um, nope, 0 is not in that interval. Negative one's not in that interval. Wait, where? Negative three. The first interval. Negative three. Negative three, right? Oh. <laughs> what is the point that's between negative infinity and negative two? Negative three. Can you pick a negative million? Sure. Can you pick negative 1.3892? Yeah. You know, but pick something that's convenient. Let's go to the next interval, okay? What would be a convenient number that's between negative two and negative one half? Negative one. Negative one, yep. Does everybody see what I'm doing? What's the convenient number between negative one half and two? Zero. I would use zero. You can use one, and maybe let's keep one in mind when we come down here and we want other points, but zero is easier to pick it. What's two to infinity? Three. And actually, I changed my mind. Let's see, hold on, let's see. What did I do on my notes? I did zero. Okay, we'll stick with my notes. I was going to say, the only reason why I contemplate switching the zero to a one is because here in a second, we're going to find our y-intercept. How do we find our y-intercept? Make x equal zero. So we're going to already find that point down here when we find our y-intercept. So if we want to plug, let's plug one in there. Is that okay? Is anybody doing it in pen? Nope. Okay, let's make one. That way, guys, we just have an extra point to graph because we're already going to find, already going to find f of zero, okay? Um, right here in step number four. All right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take each of these test points, plug them into our function, and actually write what the value is. My fault, I just copy and pasted this from a problem, so it says h of x, but it's really f of x, g of x, whatever your function's called, okay? So that's really f of x. So what we're going to do in our calculator, guys, is plug negative three. So go ahead and get your calculator out if you haven't. Plug negative three into this function, making sure parentheses are around negative three, and tell me what you get. That's what I got. You guys get negative 25 there. And again, making sure you just have negative three in parentheses. You cube it, multiply it by two, square it, multiply it by negative eight. It's pretty big. Oh, you didn't it. cube it. Okay, so it's negative 25. So what does that mean? It means coming up to the zero. We know at negative two we're crossing the x-axis. But coming up to negative two, we have a negative y value. So what does that mean? It means our sign is negative, which means where are we located, above or below the x-axis? Below. Can we really graph negative 25? No, but at least we know from what direction we're coming from. All right, we're gonna go do the exact same thing, but now with negative one. So if you hit second entry, it brings up what you just typed in and you can go type over each of your threes and make them ones. What do you guys get when you plug in negative one? Three. I got a positive three as well, okay? So that is a positive sign, which means we've crossed over negative two and we've gone up above the x-axis. 
All right, so I do not have one in my, my um, notes, so make sure, I wanna make sure a couple of you guys get the same thing when we plug positive one in there. Negative nine, yep. So that means it's dipped past the negative one half and gone into the negatives, which means it's gone below the x-axis. And then three, we got a pretty large number again. I got positive 35 when I put three in there. What I really care about, because I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to graph 35, but I care about that it's positive. It's pretty high up there, so I know when I'm going to go towards 3, I'm going to go pretty straight up, like steep, right? So it's positive, which means it's uh, above the x-axis. And again, all this is doing is it's giving us an idea. Okay, we know we're crossing at negative 2, negative 1 and a half, positive 2, but we kind of have an idea of where our, our graph is when we're in those intervals. All right, 4. The reason why I switched this from a 0 to a 1 is because I know right here at step number 4, I'm going to find the y-intercept, meaning make x 0, right? So we'll just find f of 0. I show all my work. You do not have to because you'll see real quickly what happens when you make x 0. All the terms that have x disappear, right? And what's it only leave you with? The constant, which is just negative 4. I like to put it in um, an ordered pair, so I know I'm going to graph comma 0, negative 4. All right. So step number 5 says find a few additional points to help complete the graph. What I'm going to list first is everything I have. So we already have the zeros. We can't forget the zeros. We listed them way up here, okay? So they were negative 2, 0, negative 1 half, 0, and 2, 0. And then from the chart, we have negative 3, 25, negative 25, negative 1, 3, 1, negative 9, 3, 35. Does everybody see where those numbers are coming from? I'm just pulling them from the chart right above, our test points. So what I'm noticing is there's a really big jump from negative 2 to negative 3. We go from 0 to negative 25. So maybe let's find f of negative 2. Point. Hold on, I'm talking and you guys are still writing. So guys, I'm just pulling those. We already know our zeros. We found those on the first page, negative 2, negative 1 half, 2. And then from the chart, I'm just pulling my test points. We picked negative 3. When we plug the negative, we got a y value of negative 25. All right, so I'm just saying when I go to graph, this is a really big jump from 0 to negative 25, and this is a really big jump from 0 to 35. So I'm going to just find f of negative 2.5 and f of positive 2.5, okay? I'm just picking an x value that's between these, so maybe I get a more reasonable y value to plot. I'll just tell you what the answers are, okay? So f of negative 2.5 just means inner function that we wrote above here, up here. I just plugged negative 2.5 in for x and did the math there, all right? When I did that, I got a y value of negative 9. So that means negative 2.5, negative 9 is a plot point I can plot. That is going to be on my graph, which is good. So I'm glad I did it because negative 3, negative 25, I couldn't plot. And then I did the same thing, but I did it with positive 2.5. And I actually got a positive 13.5. Okay, and again, we're kind of off the chart, but at least we kind of have an idea of where it is. So now we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven-ish points to plot because we can't really plot negative three and positive three because our y values are off the graph. I always start with my zeros, okay? So negative two, zero, go ahead and plot that, guys. Negative one, half, zero, we're not quite all the way to one, we're like halfway to it, and then positive two, zero. Then I go use my test points that I can plot. Negative 3, negative 25 doesn't work. But negative 1, um, positive 3 I can plot. Um, 1, negative 9 I can plot. 
Oh, we can't even forget, don't forget about this. We have our x-intercept, our y-intercept, excuse me. We have our y-intercept we can plot too, zero, negative four. Those actually kind of give us a pretty good idea of what's going on, but if you need extra points to graph, you can point our negative two and a half at negative nine. So two, two and a half over all the way down here. And then positive two and a half, we're kind of up here, like three, three cubes above, you know. All right, so how do we know even to begin to connect the dots? Well, remember the very first thing we were asked on the front page was the end behavior, right? So this was a cubic function that opened up, meaning it went from there and went up. So we're coming down here from like negative 35, right? And we're gonna come up here, we're gonna cross the x-axis at negative two. We're gonna go hit a max at some point. We're gonna assume it's relatively close to this one. Come down here, go through our y-intercept, go down to negative nine and cut back up. So we're gonna have that snake shape, but it's gonna be extreme, okay? So just try your best to kind of graph what's going on. Go back up to this point up here. And then just before we check it on our calculator, one of the rules they told us on front is that you'll have it at most as many intercepts as your degree. So it was a third degree polynomial and we have three, one, two, three intercepts and you'll have at most n minus one terms or max and min. So since it's a third degree, degree polynomial, we should have at most two terms, which we do. We have a max here and a min here. So that all works. Last case, if you wanted to, you could type this into your calculator. Let's just do it real quick. So honestly, I just asked you to be honest when you're doing your homework. We all can just throw this in our calculator and pick the right graph on my math lab. But this is what I'm going to expect you to do without a calculator, or I'll have like a little scientific calculators for you so you can do this part with a calculator. So as you work on my math lab, yeah, can you just throw it in here and pick the right graph? Sure. But you're not going to be studying the way I would want you to be studying, okay? So in our calculator, let's go ahead and our y equals button, clear out what we have and type our function, 2x to the third plus x to the second minus 8x minus 4. Then I'm just going to hit graph, zoom, standard. So mine's already at the standard thing. And hopefully it looks relatively close to what we did. I like it. Isn't that pretty cool that you're able to do that? Like I would never think I'd have this crazy cubic function thrown at me and I'd be able to do it by hand without using any kind of graphing calculator.